be here and uh, have the opportunity to give this talk. And um, um, I would really like to have a little bit of an interaction, so I guess we can put more clarifying, short type of questions uh, during the presentation and then the big discussions we can save at the end, so, so, so we, we make sure that we get through it, but uh, I really like you to, to put the questions that you need to sort of understand what, what we think. People can see. So, um, the topic here is 5G systems meeting the requirements of the network <coughs> society. So I will try to be a little bit broader than just the radio access. So it will be a little bit more radio system, and it will be, I will touch a little bit upon this, the impact on society and how this could be used and so on. But of course, the core of this is still the radio access part, as you will see. So I'm from Ericsson Research, and uh, we, we, we are, of course, uh, a, a, a lot of us in Sweden, but in Europe, and we have something in the US, and we have in Asia, and so on. And we have been around for a while, so, so we have worked with all of these uh, DSM, HSPA, LD, LD Advanced, and now we're putting quite significant of our resources into 5D research. Um, of course, uh, we are working a lot with IPRs, and also, but we're also publishing a lot in conferences. <laughs> And we work then together with different universities uh, where we have sites and also selected places then, of course. And all in all, we are like 600 persons uh, and we have a 40% PhD in, in Ericsson Research. So that's a little bit um, where we are. And then we have organized ourselves. So we are, we are trying here to cover sort of wireless access networks, which is uh, my, my area. I'm, I'm heading the wireless access networks. Radio access technologies is a little bit more on, on the layer one uh, of the radio access, but we, most of the radio stuff goes actually very much across these two research areas. We have uh, one set of people working on the cloud technologies. IP and transport is there. Management, I think management is getting more and more attention. And not only management of uh, telecommunication things, we are thinking about managing more and more things. Uh, application services, media, uh, network functions on top of that, up the top of the cloud. Security and sustainability is, is also part of our scope. So this tells you a little bit of where, where I'm from, so to say, and uh, what we are doing. So um, the Network Society, I think uh, this is sort of the Ericsson vision or, uh, about how this future will look like, where everything is connected, that would benefit of a connection what that would mean for, for the society. And I think we, we, have, we have, going back a little bit, we have the introduction of the mobile telephony. That was a huge thing, right? Now we are in the middle of the mobile global data and the smart, everybody having a smartphone uh, and, and all the impact of that. But we think that that's actually smaller steps compared to what will come when sort of everything, all the connected devices, the mobile broadband, as we know it today, get much, much more advanced, providing sort of virtual reality, augmented reality uh, possibilities. And looking at industry per industry, I think we will see the enormous shift when all the other industries take our technology and apply that in their process. <coughs> uh, an example that already happened is get the music industry completely transformed from being sort of selling CDs to streaming music. So that is fully digitalized. And, and, and um, we are seeing, I guess, the same thing now on, on, the, on the TV and the video and, and sort of in the middle of happening, moving to that. And then I think you can think about healthcare, I think education, you think of the smart cities. All of this will be very, very different. So uh, uh, I think we haven't seen nothing yet, so to say. So this is all in front of us. And this is, I think it's very exciting. Yeah. And a uh, little bit of proof points of, of this uh, happening is, of course, the, the mobile broadband traffic of today. And now we're talking exabyte per month here. It's a huge, huge, huge number of, of, of data going in, in the networks today, 2013. I think we see that looking now to 2019, five, six years into the future, we see a tenfold of that. 
and uh, this is sort of reaching this 2020 horizon where we talk a lot about the 5G sort of being introduced in 5G in, in 2020. So this is sort of the, what will happen before we do enter in, in, in the full 5G time frame. Of, of the <coughs> and I think we have lowered the predictions a little bit here. Um, before we were talking about 1,000 times more traffic over 10 years, that was a doubling every year. So if you were to double here, you would reach a higher number after five years, right? It, it would be more. So this is just 10 times. It's still exponential growth, but we have lowered it a little bit. And I think this is not really on the demand side. The demand is still there. I think we, we, we could do much, much more, I think. Today, I mean, typical bucket today is like two gigabytes per month, right? And that would then only go to 20 gigabytes per month in six years. And, and I think we all feel that we can use much, much more than that. I think we one gigabyte a day is sort of already today. I mean, if, if I turn on my sort of mobile broadband, phone here and the families we are out sort of my kids easily consume one gigabyte a day already now right so, so and I'm still a one of these unlimited plans so, <laughs> so I have a question for you man yeah. I've seen these numbers right and I always wondered is this number sort of inclusive of what goes over Wi-Fi for instance if I look at my data right whatever mobile data I do I think a significant amount of it I do it's over right. a Wi-Fi yeah this is and not, not necessarily over like a wide area connection. No. So, so I'm always trying to sort of understand what this. Mm. This, this is uh, uh, going over to EPP technologies and LTE, HSP, GSM. It's not Wi-Fi. So therefore, and if you add that, it'll perhaps be like what? Times. What is the magnitude yeah. more? Yeah. 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 And, and exactly, yeah. if you were to look at the complete internet traffic, yeah. mobile broadband over 3 EPP technologies is like five percent. Okay. Growing. But it's, it's still a smaller part of all of that. And I guess there you have such a huge uh, growth there on TV or video type of traffic to the homes in, in that chunk there. So that's a huge, huge uh, volume, right, that we can never sort of take on here. Uh, because I think this, this prognosis here is a little bit what is realistic to build out in some markets. This is really showing that operators then need to have 10 times higher capacity in the networks. And I think just updating to the latest technology, that is to reform and get LTE on all your frequencies, that will give a few, two, three times, I think. Then I guess operators are hoping to get a little bit more spectrum that could give a factor two, something like that. And then they will need to invest in much denser networks. So doubling the number of base stations is a heavy investment, right? And, and that could give a factor two then, and then you can go for small cells on top of that. So this is, I think it's realistic to do this, but it, it is, I think it's more limited on what kind of buckets operator will offer on the market than what we actually would like to use. So that, that's, uh, and then of course you need, you need to think about this is a global thing, right? So um, the development in some countries is going faster, and, and when it's transformation into a, the U.S. Is, is in the lead in that, in that sense. So I think the numbers in, in, in the U.S. will look even more like. And, and looking at numbers, I think this is perhaps even more amazing that we now have 2 billion people Smart. having a smartphone. And in the end of this prognosis, it will be like over 5 billion people, people having this. This is a very advanced computer, right, with a fairly large screen connected to the internet for more than 5 billion people. So this is a huge importance, of course, for all the populations and, and all the growing economies as well, of course. For that 5.6, what fraction of them, for what fraction of them will that be the only connection to the internet? Yeah, it will. For, for the majority, half? it would be. Most? Yeah, the, mo more than half. Yeah. Something like that. Mm. So, looking at huge numbers, I think this is really impressive. Then, then we have this sort of um, uh, transition between the different uh, 3D people technologies. Then, so here we have uh, what has happened up until now, and what we will see what happened. Uh, 
we are also into LTE and say that, yeah, that that's really the, the key, key technology. And I think the last quarter, you see here, it, it, the graph is like that. You, you have a little bit C CDMA only sort of flattish TD SCDMA. That's that really is a sort of a flat DSM is sort of peaked now and. and DSM only capable devices are actually going down from now on. But these devices would then be able, will be of course a, a HSP DSM device, a DSM as, as, as together with HSP still growing. And on top of that we have the transition from HSPA to FE. So last the last quarter of, of Q3 last year, 25 million new FE subscribers were added which is a huge number, but we have 80 million HSPA subscribers at it. So the, still, the growth of HSPA is larger than the growth of FE. Still. So it's, <laughs> uh, this shift of technology takes, takes quite some time. And this is of course worldwide, and it goes faster and slower on different markets. So all, all, even in the, in the end of this period here, we, we are thinking about that perhaps we have a LTE coverage like for 50% of, of the population of the Earth, but an 80% will be on the HSPA or something from the coverage point of view. So it's a fairly easy to forget about this when, when you are now talking about LTE and now we talk about 5G today, uh, which will start to be introduced over here somewhere. That it's still a lot of old technologies um, uh, out there. So, uh, looking at this network society that we talked about, what, what would that mean if you were now to try to switch a little bit? How should we then build this technology? What, are, what, are, what is the technology needed to realize the needs that, that we do envision here? And uh, it's for sure not only radio access technology is part of it, but it's, but when we look at this, we, we see that we have, of course, a huge number of devices that, that would be a much more diversified than, than we have today, of course. Today we have the smartphones, but this we have all the machines and everything that's being connected. These would, like, of course, be, would like to get services. And, and the services uh, would then be realized in, in sort of a, a cloud environment on top of a cloud. And devices need to be connected to, to a network. And we see, of course, that the network and the cloud sort of goes together as well. So this is really sort of the building blocks in order to be able to provide these devices, users, with all of these services that need to be sort of connected with the cloud and the network in order to get this. And, and then, uh, looking still from a sort of a building block perspective, management of all of this will increase in importance to, to, to be able to give the right sort of quality of service and, and this, this thing will not be less complex, it will be even more complex with all of these things involved. So the management of all of this would, would, would be a key thing. And I think we would like to stretch the management out to services, we would like to use sort of the telecom management capabilities when we connect in the smart grid we connect all the electricity producers consumers stuff then we could also manage these things not only from the connection point of view but also from a sort of electricity grid point of view to some extent of course we can't take over other industries core management part but managing all of these connected devices which is really dependent on the connection in order to be part of the system. There you can think about managing things goes a little bit broader than just management of the telecommunication. Security is, uh, is getting, uh, of course, more and more critical since a lot of this will be more and more mission critical things connected on these networks. So a lot of basic needs in society will be dependent on these uh, systems, so security of all of this. And in general, I think security is getting higher and higher on the agenda, right? So, uh, and sustainability in the fact, not only sort of keeping the energy consumption down on this system, that we can, that we can uh, provide all the connectivity and all the capacity, and still 
do not increase the energy consumption in this industry. That's one thing. But of course, it's all the sustainability, socio-economics aspects of having these systems, providing sort of government, uh, healthcare, education, as I want to, the much broader set of people. So, uh, and then I, I guess we, we can talk about an operator centric world today. It will begin much more of a user driven landscape. We, we, when we look into this, we, we can see that we are defining sort of what is the network, what is the cloud, what is the device, everything is getting a little bit blurred here. And uh, we would like, of course, that we see the requirements here. We would like to support that from the network side, but also provide new services to the devices. So it will be an interaction here. So narrowing it down a little bit now, getting a little bit closer to technology. So what, what's the 5G system then? And it, of course, now we are really on this, to this, uh, this cloud and the network part of the previous picture, how could that look like? And uh, today we will focus on, on this part here, sort of devices, relays, antennas, radio units, digital units, sort of the baseband processing, the radio of course. But uh, this is really uh, connected to a, a network infrastructure where we will have more and more capabilities in the sense of storage and computing available in the network and then it will connect to these data centers, of course. So, and, and then we say that we, all of this, what today is sort of core network functions being run in servers, you know, uh, specialized services, services, they will operate here on top of, of this cloud execution environment that goes across sort of the data center, the network, and all the way out here to the base stations. So it could be mobility servers that is on top of this environment. It could be different security authentication. And all of these things that we today have in sort of the core network will transform to be run on top of a cloud environment. So it's not only the fact that we have a centralization to in the data centers and, and mo moving applications into the cloud and the data center. We are also transforming the way that we are building the network. These are also being run on top of a sort of a cloud environment where, where then the cloud environment is getting distributed. So it's not only the data center cloud type of thing, it's all the way out into the network. So I think we see two, two things. Now shortly everything is getting more and more concentrated and, and, and being collected a lot in the data centers. But over time, when we have these capabilities in the network, I think we will see a distribution again, moving out computation, storage capabilities further out in the network in order to be able to realize really demanding uh, sort of real-time delay-sensitive type of applications. And reliable. And, and reliable. Yes, and reliable, exactly. So robust reliability is, is for sure a key thing. Uh, the same thing you, you can think about this, the, we will have this, uh, the radio units, antennas is physical things that needs to be out there apparently, right? Uh, but the, the baseband could, so some part, be also decentralized and done in this network cloud environment. So there is a some sort of a centralization aspect, but we have also the opposite aspect where we are pushing baseband out because we would like to do these antennas much, much more advanced. So we will have not only three, four antenna elements, it will be hundred of antenna elements, and we would like to have individual steerable beams, and then you need the baseband and the processing all the way out into the antenna. So I think a lot of this will actually be moved out in much more advanced antennas. So that's also a distribution going on. So it's both sort of centralization and distribution. I, I mentioned reliability because we've been looking at the survivability of networks here, starting with Hurricane Katrina and moving up to the more recent uh, um, events. Mm. Uh, the cellular system has been the communication system that's remained up. Mm. And the one that, that uh, emergency services respond, reply, depend on as opposed to the dedicated uh, services. Mm. Yes, I think that's very interesting. I think we would like in this smart city and, and this sort of 
things that we would really like to be to build on top of these systems would be national security, public safety kind of systems. And then reliability of this is extremely interesting. And they have the advantage over the dedicated services that they are used all the time heavily so that you know the status of the network. Yeah, and, and there are battery backups and everything. Right. But of course, they could still be vulnerable if you don't have sort of redundancy all the way. But or you build them in basements as AT&T did. Yeah. 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 But That's if you kill sort of down one base station, the rest works, right? So it's very dense infrastructure, so it's, it's sort of robust by its design. But I think we can do much more than that. So that, this was uh, uh, on, on this thing. So now shifting a little bit further down, so, so now we are into sort of the radio, radio access and, and thinking about, so okay, 5G radio access, what, what, what should that be? And uh, when, when we look at the 5G radio access, we, I think we, we have challenges here. And the traffic growth, the, the traffic volume, this, this will still be there, right? And we'll have that during the coming five years, and that will continue. So we will need to build systems which are much more dense in order to increase the capacity. And if we did build large microcellular systems, we are now in the next five years, I think we will build more pico-based or smaller-based systems, partly going to indoor. I think to, the continuation here will be much more dense indoor systems, taking a lot of this traffic. So this is, this is <coughs> the key thing. The other thing is the, the, the growth of the connected devices. Previously, we just looked at the smartphones and all of that. Here, I think we will see the number of connected devices will, of course, grow. And if you think about having 5 billion smartphones, we are easily thinking about 50 billion connected devices, a factor of 10 more devices in the beginning of this 5G period, right? So, so, so to the 50 billion, we believe we will have already 2020. And of course, we need to build something that lasts for a while, right? So perhaps 500 billion is something. But it's a huge number of connected devices, and we need to think about <coughs> how to handle all of this in a cost-efficient way. And they are very different. Uh, it's, it's sort of connected car, which is very capable. You can have a lot of screens. You have sort of a, a battery backup and everything. And then you can have a small temperature sensor, right, which is very limited capability. So it's a huge uh, diversity in the number of different, the type of connected devices that we will have. And this leads to that we have a fairly wide range of requirements and characteristics onto this system. We, we can, of course, still speed and latency, so sort of higher speed, lower latency. That, that trend will, will continue, and that's perhaps easier to predict. I mean, we have seen what we did 2G, 3G, 4G, and take that factor of 10, and then you are fairly close on that one, I would say. But uh, we have energy efficiency, which has not been so clearly expressed when we have done the design of the previous systems. And we have not really looked at this uh, battery-operated devices. So we are really not optimized for, for, for living on one battery as long as possible, right? And also from a coverage point of view, that is the biggest strength of these systems, that we have this wide area coverage. But we haven't really optimized for low data rate further out in sort of all the way out in the basements or something. <laughs> and stationary equipment is of, of course also vulnerable because I mean they if they if they are in a fading dip they are they will be there forever so to say. So coverage is is, is actually one key thing that we, we would like to address as well. So we would stretch this in coverage, we would like to make it more energy efficient and we would like to make it a higher speed and lower latency. And then we have this robustness, resilience, security type of things on top of that. So, so this is a very contradictory requirement as well, leading to that we, our conclusion is that we will need to look at systems which have multiple modes in this. And we're sort of integrating different modes into something. It's really not possible to make this super 10 gigabit per second thing at the same time as you should be in a temperature sensor type of thing. So it has to be a little bit more different modes of something. 
And then from affordable and sustainability point of view, uh, it's of course key thing. So it has to build a little bit on the investments that we are doing now in the networks. And, and, and I mean, we have all the, the success of the mobile broadband and investments being done to, up to now and the coming five years. And so then we need to build on that. So it has to be a little bit a, a migration story in this, of course. So, so this is sort of challenges. And shifting a little bit over to scenarios, use cases, a little bit of a mix here. Um, I think we, we will, of course, have sort of micro base station, wide area coverage, smaller base stations, and, and smartphones, and, and, and the de development of smartphones. This, this will sort of be a key component of this, of course. Uh, but there is so much more here. If you take the stretches this, I think we will reach something which we can call the ultra dense networks, where you can have multiple access points, perhaps in this room. And if you were to do something out to it, will just be sort of 50 meters in between or something like that. Um, so that's where one very sort of, and, and there you you would like to have this uh, 10 gigabit per second data rate, and in order to do that, you would need a, a, a wider carrier, right? So perhaps one gigahertz or something, and that you most likely go up in frequency in order to find, so to say. So, so this is sort of a clear. Clear attend. I will return a little bit to the details on this one. And to some players, this might be the only 5G thing. But I don't. I don't believe so. I think this is a much broader uh, set of needs and requirements that we should look at. So vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to road, and all of these traffic uh, uh, situ applications. Uh, machine type communications, uh, sensor networks, uh, stuff logistics, uh, smart meters. I think it would be interesting to think about uh, industrial control, going in to see what kind of other processes that, that we could provide communication to. And here there, there are extreme uh, reliability, uh, low delay type of requirements, I think. The smart grid being a key part of that. This is also pushing down the requirements on delay. I think we, we can also see much more sort of uh, device to device uh, type of, of settings where, where the devices could cooperate in different ways. And it could also be a multi hope type of things in order to have a network where the infrastructure is, is broken for some reason. So it is a broad, uh, broad picture, I think, about uh, what is all the sort of use cases. And, and here I think we see that. Yeah. yeah, we have the LTE and the, the stuff in the middle here, yes, of course, but we have use cases here on the ultra dense. We have the, this vehicle to vehicle, the industrial control, device to device. We see a lot of different uh, technology components in this as well, which is a little bit beyond what is at least in the LTE standard of today. Then, of course, part of this could be included in the LTE and so on. So, so it's it's still uh, open how the what will how much of this that will require an evolution of LTE and what would require something different. So, so. I think so, so let's let's uh, return to that as well. When you talk about ultra dense, yeah, the average life of uh, buildings is thirty to fifty years, um, and so you're talking about retrofitting buildings with several base stations. Um, that's an interesting challenge, and the cost of a whole, if the traffic is mission critical, the cost of a whole becomes much higher than it currently is, where it's just an annoyance. Um, how do you, I mean, that's at the, the, the high density end. The other end of it is when I go to Cornell University, of course my GPS, my uh, Google Maps doesn't work because there's no coverage there. Um, so you have these holes, which now, if you put everything into this mission critical network, filling the holes becomes a much higher priority. And it's not obvious to me how you do that. Have you mm -hmm. thought that through, or are you just looking at how to get the high density into the, the other parts? Mm -hmm. I, I think there is multiple, I think, 
this this could be sort of dedicated building by building where you do that in a building and then you get this <laughs> superior service there it could be an uh, important enterprise customer that you build it for or it, it could be uh, perhaps a university or something that special type of you know, communities that would like to have this upper dense network because they really would like to have 10 gigabit per second so then they are willing to invest in that I'm not saying perhaps that this will go into all buildings, right? It, 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 it could still be valuable if it, even if it's just sort of a few buildings. Uh, the coverage holes and, and the need of even better coverage of systems if, if you want to make them more and more mission critical, I think that has to be a wide area, of course. And, and there we, we are doing a, a few things already without the evolution of that. So that will come as well. Okay. But I fully agree. This is different, two different problems. Mm -hmm. And two different investors, I think. But it's related to the, the word <coughs> mission critical. Yeah. It's when you put your eggs yeah. in that basket, somehow, suddenly yeah. the holes become not just an annoyance, but... Yeah. Um, but perhaps this one more. might not be the mission critical. That, yeah, thing. I agree with that. Yeah. You don't need the high-speed video for no. most things. I think we, we will see now different spectrum of needs and we will see different ways of, show, of it could of course could be license spectrum but it could be a different control sharing situation I think we, we see very interesting or it could be sort of completely unlicensed as well so I think there is a lot of interesting research as well so if we were to point out something which has the biggest momentum and, and where most players are betting what is 5G, I think that you, you will end up something here. And so, so this is an ultra dense network. Um, it's, it's drawn here as a little bit old fashioned base stations, but this is, of course, sm small uh, dots or something, yeah, yeah, small access points. And uh, it's, uh, it's extreme capacity and it's multi gigabits. So, in order to have multiple gigabits, we need to go up in bandwidth, so it's more, perhaps more than 500 megahertz, perhaps 1 gigahertz of bandwidth. And in order to find that, it seems that we need to look around 20 gigahertz something. There is possibility to find such spectrums. And uh, then, of course, you have a challenge with, with the propagation properties and the coverage and such, so you would need to build them very dense. I, I think the, 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 the fact that you build dense is not the target in itself, right? It's a consequence of that you would like to provide these data rates and the capacity, and the fact that you need to look for higher frequencies. So, but then of course, having said that you should build as dense this dense, you would like to extend the coverage as much as possible, of course. And then you end up in this, that of course, the way to do that is to work with antennas. So you will have beam forming antennas at the base stations and or at the access points and at the terminals. <coughs> and if you have two such directional antennas and you, you are outside line of sight, you can reach two kilometers, right? I mean, that's a microwave link. This, this is not new. But non-line of sight, how do you do that? And then it turns out that reflection is fairly good in this. So you, if you can find one reflection, then you can reach this. And then if you so then you have so you can think of an outdoor thing. You, you, you're trying to cover a square or something and, and, and you can reach a little bit around the corners with one reflection. Um, so then you need antenna tracking beam forming at both ends that tracks this reflection point, right? So you have antennas to, both sides trying to figure out to, to track this, this beam and then that reflection disappears and you need to find a new reflection somewhere so you need to sometimes beam finding, beam tracking type of, of properties in such system <coughs> and of course even indoor I don't think if I just body loss uh, people in between you move a little bit around and so on I think the beam tracking uh, properties will also be but perhaps they could be a little bit less advanced if you have an access point in every room. But if you want to build an outdoor system stretching sort of coverage, I think this <laughs> the beam forming is, is really a key property here. 
you're looking at 20 gigahertz, but you could also look at IR for that for that kind of network deployment, right? Infrared. Yeah. Is there a reason that? Uh, yeah, I think you can. And you can also look at 60 gigahertz, of course. Mm -hmm. um, um, but in some sense, the infrared is is resting on top of an enormous amount of existing development and technology. Um, uh, but from a coverage point of view, if you if you do the infrared, or or you, I, I really don't know this, but the feeling is that you already do it within, within one room, right? But this is you were talking about yeah. one base station per room, yeah. and depending on reflections, that's but a I'm, sweet spot for optics. Yeah, but I think if you would, if you were to, I think we, we are we we are looking for something here, which is, I think the research from our side on this is to make it a little bit. A little bit sparser than this, and we want to stretch coverage in order to have outdoor systems. And outdoor to outdoor line of sight or with one reflection seems possible. It seems also possible to from outdoor shoot through windows mm -hmm. to get coverage in rooms on that side of the building. That could be. But to try to do a reflection and then through a window, I don't know. <laughs> then I think you are lost. Right? <laughs> so, 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 and then, I mean, then the infrared, is, yeah, perhaps not. I think we, we are still sort of in, in this range uh, looking at it. But others are looking at 60, and yes, academia are, of course, that they are about 100 and looking at terahertz and stuff as well. So. I just wonder because the, the mobile companies like Ericsson have little experience in optics. Yeah, yeah. And the optical companies, which have an enormous embedded infrastructure and, and uh, <coughs> uh, product base already, have no experience in mobile. And so I don't think either of them are looking at each other's uh, no. technology no. for that reason. No, yeah, it's a good point. What are optical companies? When you say when you, these optical companies? Fibers are all fiber. I mean, free space optics is a, is a fiber link when you remove the fiber and put in two lenses. And you can do one bounce off of a building. And I mean, all the things you're talking about here at 60 gigahertz or even 30 or 40 gigahertz look the same in infrared. Okay. Except good. you've already got yeah. infrared technology. You don't have 60 gigahertz no. technology. Does, does, does Lucid do optical? No, oh, sure. If I used to. Are there people who sell free space optical yes. commercial systems? You can buy a laser, laser based. Multi gigabit per multi second. Multi gigabit per second yeah. link. The only problem is that there are some issues with that. You know, it's snow. Fog, snow, rain. But then microwave has similar, issues with similar like, well, issues. Well, 60 gigahertz, right? I mean, 60 gigahertz doesn't like snowflakes either. But uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, 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 I think the propagation properties in these ranges started to be more and more like light. So, right. so, it, so the two are. are Mushing together, yeah. it's just that they have different technology and research bases, which mm -hmm. are very separated because of historical trends. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so um, we would like them to, to use work a lot. So, so antenna technologies with several hundred antenna elements within one sort of antenna. That 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 would be a key sort of technology step in this building such a baseband in that same unit. So, so this is. Uh, very interesting area, I would say. Yeah, and, uh, the key thing, if, if you want to single out one thing, um, and uh, I think it should be low cost, of course, self configuring, and all of that. We believe that access and backhaul will be more and more integrated. In. So there will be one system. You, you will not have one system for backhaul and one system for access. It will be all in, in one. <coughs> uh, and. Uh, then I think this is the seamless integration with the wide area. This is an interesting thing, and uh, it will be very, very difficult to have the same kind of radio properties and having this link all up all the time. So how to make the control signaling and all this beam tracking thing? You won't end up in radio failures all the time and signaling filling the stuff. You would like really to use it for data, right? So uh, here I think there is a, a huge need to un for understanding the properties of, of such a system based on this beam tracking antennas. How would that radio link really be and, and what kind of control signaling and stuff you should have. 
One interesting solution is of course just to look at the booster and you do all of that signaling on the wide area, lower frequency set. So, so you have robustness to uh, connecting this to, to, the, to, to the mobile broadband system, so to say, on 2 gigahertz or something. And then you have to have a data booster on that. But uh, you mean, you uh, mean that could be a too simple solution. That, that would be one obvious one. But I think we should look for also a self-contained system on this frequency. You mean like if the beams get lost to use lower frequencies to somehow coordinate no, roughly? I mean that all your mobility, authentication, <coughs> all the signaling is done on the two. Control network. Yeah, control yeah, yeah, yeah. It's done on the two. Try to understand what, what is all the beamforming you do at the, at the regular layer. I mean, you don't coordinate beamforming. No, it's but if the properties way. of that get too unstable, and, and <coughs> then you, you lose the link all the time. And then you need to reconnect, and that, that's a lot of signaling in order to do all of that. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, exactly. So if you can move that down to, to okay. a lower frequency, you can have a robust connection, and then you can have this data booster coming and going a little bit. Yeah. And you don't need as much signaling back and forth just to tell you exactly what to do, because if you have all of that up, and then you have you know, a 10 gigabit type, type of booster thing that you connect. And if you lose that for a millisecond, and, and then you have it again, fine. I mean, that's not a problem. So I think that that would be one kind of setup, but I, I would not say that this is that it would be like that. I think we should also consider to do something standalone as well. So Michael, I have a question. So the, about the access backhaul integration. So the people who are working on small cells and doing backhaul for small cells. Is that how they're trying to do it? Are they thinking that they're integrating it with access? I somehow thought they were trying to. No, they are typically not. They are. They are they are looking for some uh, other radio technology to right, be used. That's what I was Otherwise, a microwave link, which is a point-to-point -point thing, and then you can do that. Could develop to a point-to-multipoint, and also take a little bit known line of sight cases. That's one option. We have this Wi-Fi-like things on five gigahertz that you can use, and so on. But then, then you end up in a situation that you have multiple systems. One system where you need to manage and operate with all, all of its sort of uh, quality of service issues and everything, you have another system on the access. If you could put this all together, so you can think of LTE feeding LTE, so to say, then it, that would just be one system to operate. And, and so it's more on this operational cost type of issues. <coughs> and you also get, of course, the advantage that all the development that is going on, all the innovation investment on the access link is also applicable directly on the access link. And from a product point of view, it could be the same software and everything. It could be really, really fully integrated into one system. It's more this more practical aspect. So yeah, because I thought some of the the advances in the access link are kind of slowing down. Right? I mean, that's sort of been fundamentally the one of the issues, right? In that how many bits per second per hertz are we getting? I mean, how much have we pushed it? Yeah. Really, I mean, all, yeah, the, yeah, all yeah. the curves we drew for. Yeah, for yeah. how data is exploding yeah. all that, right? We can sort of see whether the bits per second per hertz over the last couple of decades. Yeah. <coughs> it's not looking so good, right? No, no, no. So, so I, I thought that's why... Um, yeah, so but there's an interesting point of view. I, yeah. I, not I, I, think, you, operation point yeah. of view. I think you... Looking back, I think <coughs> you can easily see that we have gained a factor of 10 or something. But from a capacity point of the system, we, we have built 1,000, right? Yeah. So we have densified, we have more spectrum. And this is my... This is just keeping it. And, and I, I think the capacity build up we're talking about is densifying, is still sort of the key thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're getting closer and closer to the Shannon guy. <coughs> it's getting more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> so, shifting to the connected devices, and, 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 and this is really uh, something uh, where we have seen now things start to happen. And when we look at this, we have to try to divide it a little bit because. I think it's a mistake to believe that this is sort of one use case. This is a multiple of use cases which, which are much more diverse in, in themselves than compared to, to the other use cases. So meters and sensors, where, where we have sensors, actuators, small, simple, low cost, but it's sort of a massive scale. And it's sort of low energy consumption, long range type of things. This is 
is sort of one type of applications. Intelligent transport systems where we connect vehicles. Here we have a lot of mobility and uh, if we want to really stretch this one into sort of remote driving and this kind of, of applications then uh, delay will become extremely important, robustness of this <coughs> and then, then this so this case could to the start will be a very special use case characterized with a lot of mobility but it could move actually to be part of this more critical communication systems where we would like to go in and control and, uh, things in more industrial processes we would like to uh, be part of smart cities and, and, and then this reliability, availability, security, autonomous operation would be sort of key uh, requirements. So I think these are, are fairly different. Uh, so let's discuss them a little bit uh, one by one here. And most things when we talk machine to machine has happened in this first one. It's, there is more, more development and, and of course the LTE was not really done for this. And, and if you look at this you you can see RLT device simple. Well, they were, they are a quite high requirement on the machine to machine device in order to fit an LTE type of mod module in there. Um, are they well reachable? Yeah, it's not really optimized for that. It, it, it's, it's a good coverage of the system, but it's not really optimized to have extreme coverage to reach the basements and so on. And have we done this in order to operate on a battery for multiple years? No, not really, right. So, so th this is sort of identified and this is already being addressed. And, and so this is ongoing work in release 12 of 3D Pipida. So this is coming now in the next release. So we have looked at reducing cost of this. And we believe that we could, by making it more, stripping it, so you can only have one receive antenna instead of two, you would limit the rate of data rates down to 1 megabit and you can use just 1.4, you don't need to, to use the complete bandwidth then you, you can reduce the cost of such a device <coughs> you can also think about half duplex or reduce the bandwidth even further so, so there is of course fairly straightforward ways of doing a little bit more making a mode in LTE more targeted for this on the coverage side you can then look at all the different control channels and you can see what kind of margins you have and, and you can do a little bit of repetition, power boosting, relax some performance requirements and so on. So it's possible to address quite a lot of this. This, this will not take us all the way but it will, I think we will, if you have now most of the machine to machine stuff that goes on 3 dpp they are DSM based and that's of course due to the, the coverage of DSM but also the cost of DSM due. I think we can, we can sort of reduce that gap and make the LTE device in the same cost as a, of a DSM <coughs> device today. So this is, this is interesting and, and uh, looking a little bit from a technology point of view, what really consumes the energy here and when you have very infrequent transmissions like, like, like we are looking at here it is not really the, the reception and then the, the transmission of these. It's that it's a dispatching cycles when you wake up your receiver to listen if there is some signaling for you. And the longest you can put this, I think, is, is the order of one second or something today. Then you need to wake up and listen all the time. So you do that every second. So just increasing this to 10 seconds or a couple of minutes, that, that would that will make a huge impact on, on the battery consumption of. So what's the main reason why one second is currently used? Yeah, timing from uh, timers. Yeah, but uh, I mean, it, it, it's built for a human social activity. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. When you want a fast response time, you, you would like to be able to page the, the and, and you would like to have a response. If you when you push a link, yeah, you want to set up the connection and you want to do that quickly. So in 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 the system today, this this paging cycle is set much much shorter. So it's devices it's today they, they go up all the time and listen to. <coughs> But so the longest you can put it, and, and, and when we did this, we didn't think about the right, machine. It's that, a that system symposium, it's not a technology. No, it, it, was, it was just not uh, okay. 
part of the requirement space. <laughs> right. So, so, so this is a little bit to go back and, and, and uh, I mean, so do it once more and do right. I mean, this is. So there is actually one, one other question. I mean, we're talking about really, really large number of devices, right? Is the signaling system in general capable of handling that? Mm. Plus, are, I mean, there are obviously ways, you know, especially for stationary devices, I mean, they're not going to move. Which means that all the assumptions in signaling yeah. are wrong at the moment. Right? Yeah. yeah, but, but uh, for those devices. Yeah, but I think we have checked a little bit on that, and, and uh, that's really not the problem. I think, I think for it, LTE scales in that way. It can handle this from the radio, the paging, and everything, and all the controls and everything. So, so that even I mean, with large number of devices. Yeah. Yes, it works. I think we have looked at more than 50 billion, and, and I mean we. Are, so it doesn't really seem to be the big showstopper on that side. You, you, you can do it. There is also work on this, doing this, this active part and thinking about perhaps you could, if you, if you have really little data, perhaps you can send that, just piggyback it on the random That's access, basically. So you never set up a radio connection. You just do this <coughs> That's what I was thinking. Uh, network uh, <coughs> directly terminal to core signaling, basically. Of course, there's radio in there, but it, the radio is never set up formally. It just goes on the red, random axis. Mm -hmm. So, so th that's being discussed as well. But it's, yeah, you can do a little bit there, but we don't think that that's the major hurdle election. Um, so all of this is then uh, being uh, done, really. But I think we, we have also looked at this concept, which uh, which we think would be an interesting complement. We will do everything we can on the LDE side, of course, to, to make that as valuable as mark as possible. But let's uh, face facts, right? That the majority of these devices connected that we predict will be short range type of radio devices, and, and they will be non 3D PP type of devices. Could be Bluetooth, low energy, could be 802.15, it could be uh, Wi Fi, this AH mode that's coming out. So there's a lot of things going on. But these can also be, of course, provided for local connectivity at the edge. So we would like to look at a scenario which, where we have a capillary gateway here, which is connected over the sort of LTE network, the radio and the core. And we can have in the core, we can have some capillary network functions. And so this will be then be backhauled with LTE and, and connected to the core. And then to reach the, the small temperature meter here. We can have another radio technology at the last top here. And this is already a little bit done now when you see in the smart meters operators in, in Europe. I think there have been a few uh, deals where, where they have applied for, for providing that service to electricity companies. And then they have used some sort of gateway structure where, where they're reaching out with LTE to the gateway and then they do this loss top over some other radio technology in many cases. But this seems to be a, a viable way of sort of doing this. And when you do this, I have done this myself at home. I have a little bit of this connected to my router. I have this little bit radio transmitter and I have temperature sensors in the home and this connects and everything, right? Then it doesn't go so real deep, it goes over fiber. But then I do something completely over the top, right? I, I go to the, the, the provided a web page and there I can find readings from my sensor, right? And, 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 and I can use that. And then I have some other sensor and I go to another web page and it gets a little bit messy, right? I, it's for sure not any secure. I do the, all the management myself. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's really a, for techie guys <laughs> working with these things. So the question is, could we then provide something here where we could authenticate these things? So we can do some bootstrapping technology from, from the security point we have here, so we can also authenticate and, and make these connections secure. Could we make all of these things then visible into some management? So we on, on the telecommunication management system can see these connected devices, although they are not formally sort of LTE devices, that they are connected to an LTE gateway. If we can do all of that, we, we can think of this will be sleeping, part of this will be in sleep mode. Could we coordinate sleep modes here so we can, we can get sort of a, a better system? I think there's a lot of things you can do. This could be mobile partly, so you can have 
they can find the best gateway to connect to. If one gateway is overloaded or is broken, they can connect to another gateway. So I think we could provide sort of connectivity, quality service, security, network management uh, within the system, or it could be all over the top. But we're looking at this possibility to add value here in the network. Uh, and, um, so, so we think this uh, capillary network concept is, is an interesting complement to having direct access to these uh, things. Uh, so to sum up a little bit on the machine side, I, I think it's fundamental to understand that this is a little bit two different cases. So there's one case here, which is simple, cheap, low energy, small data, massive numbers, which is this meters and, act and sensors. And there's one thing here where, where we really would like extremely low latencies, ultra-reliable, high availability, which is not necessarily low cost. It could be very advanced the type of systems that, that we're looking at. And uh, I don't know if you have seen these uh, presentations by Jared Fettweiss, Professor in, in Germany that talked about the tactile internet. That, yeah, that's sort of the it. shortest side time. If, if you would like to move your finger over the screen and that should follow your movement there, that's sort of the most, sort of one of the most delay sensitive things. And, and he's really talking about pushing out computational power out in the edge in order to be supported. It's extremely real time type of applications. So, um, Summarizing a little bit now, so what will happen in LTE? I think this is this is this we just have to know, right, in order to position the research a little bit in relation to this. And, and LTE is definitely not uh, stationary. This is moving in a lot of different directions. So we had the release eight nine. This was the first one. Release ten was the really the LTE advanced, where we had the carrier aggregation and, and fulfilling the sort of official <coughs> requirements. We are adding on things here now. We are working on, on 12 here. And now device to device communication is being introduced. That will for sure go on in a few releases. That gets, uh, you know, all this ad hoc networking, it gets sort of messy when you really would like to do a fully standalone system. So that will take time. Machine type, we have started with that, that will continue. We are looking into going to broadcast type of applications. The devices is getting more advanced, and of course you would like to in include receiver in improvements. So all this interference cancellation, and we talk about network assisted interference cancellation and these kind of things. It's very, very sort of obvious. Sorry, I have to laugh because we're coming back to what we used the word before. <laughs> Goes around, comes around. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, but every good idea is recycled. Yeah? I'm, sort of I'm, I'm not saying anything. Yeah. <laughs> Densification. This is, of course, been a focus. Uh, we have done a uh, lot of heterogeneous networks deployments. The antennas, it will get more and more in focus. We, we have already done MIMO, but it will be more multi user MIMO. We will have more comp things. The spectrum, flexibility, the, the carrier aggregation is perhaps the key features that, that we have introduced. You can aggregate uh, a higher, lay, higher frequency and a lower frequency carrier. You could aggregate an FTD and a TDD carrier. You can aggregate the carrier from a macro base station and from a PICO base station and aggregate. So huge, huge uh, possibilities to build networks based on this carrier aggregation scheme. So carrier aggregation is to me the most important feature. Um, and then multi rat we, we have done a lot of Wi-Fi interworking, so, so hopefully that will be more and more seamless moving between these. But uh, well, a lot more can be done on that as well. So, so you see, this points a little bit towards the scenarios and, and the requirements that I talked about. So, so this is pushing, right? But if we were like to, to summarize what we believe would be 5G, then I think we are ending up a little bit in this definition. So we have introduced new air interfaces and this continues to be there. And the evolution of this is of course different. ESM is not evolving that much more. But Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi is definitely evolving. Uh, you know, they started this high efficiency Wi-Fi study item or what they call it in you know Ghibli now. So, so that's that's moving. They they would like to address a few of the problems with Wi-Fi to make that more 
sort of cellular like if, if you say. The HSPA 3D, yeah, it's, it's moving, but the big evolution as we see is, is of course in the, on the LP side. So these will continue, right? But looking at all of these scenarios and requirements that we talked about, it will be then the need for, for new wireless technologies to, to complement here. But we would not like to define this one here. If you just were to continue this, that one would be 5G, right? We would say that this is the family of these that is 5G. And we see that because we don't believe that we would do another air interface that would replace the existing ones. It's not really possible to, to make something which is so much better that it motivates the replacement of LPE. We don't see that now. It might be happen, of course, that this high frequency thing becomes so good that it migrates down in frequency and gradually replaces everything. But it's not really what, what we see. We see we see this diversity in requirements. We believe more in this that we should have these new things, more complementary, focusing on the new specific requirements. And then we should put an effort to make this into a family of air interfaces that together sort of solve this problem. So this multi rough type of interaction is, is a key thing for us. So, so, so in the new wireless technologies, so what are the things that you sort of see there? Yeah, um, this ultra dense networks or high frequency. So you call that? That's one, I think. Uh, I can think about this some ultra <coughs> reliable low delay thing, machine type thing could be, be another. A um, lot of other things could be done by LTE. So, so it would be really the involvement here taking part of, of these different use cases and a few on this. And how the, the fraction on the market is between these is hard to say. But I think the optic seems like something we should it would be think about. If you're going up to 60 gigahertz, yeah. terahertz, you're in optics. So right, I think I really never thought of it until you sort of, I mean, it's obvious now that they say it, but. Yeah. Napoleon, of course, had an optical telegraph, free space optics. <laughs> Just needs a few repeaters. <laughs> they have repeaters. Yeah. But it was line of sight only. Yeah. So I mean it didn't look that different, just the data rate was long. Sure. Right? But the controllers were French soldiers. They, they couldn't go they couldn't. So it was actually a semaphore kind of thing. I know, that's what I was thinking. Couldn't signal plus that. So do you really believe in sixty gigahertz? No, I'm not that's asking you I'm question. not asking you in a facetious way, I'm yeah. really asking this. No. Uh, yeah. I just want to like sort of get an opinion, right? Yeah. There are some people who are really don't go on it, other people are like, no, I don't. I'm not. I'm not perhaps the, the, the believer. I don't think. Already going from two gigahertz to three point five gigahertz is a big thing, right? <laughs> and, and, and now we're talking about suddenly we are jumping from that to say sixty, right? So, so, so that's that's a big jump, right? So, so I, I think that we should stretch. I think we will have a little bit more frequency band on four gigahertz and so on, and, and perhaps we can find something on ten gigahertz, fifteen, up to twenty something. And, and there, I think we should stretch that with more and more advanced antennas. So I believe that part of this will be sort of millimeter wave thing. But I, I think 60 is something different. So That's my what, feeling. One of your, part of the, the dividing line between optics and radio is the radio is all coherent. You try to work with the baseband and modulate it directly. Optics is incoherent and you try to do something to the energy beam itself. And when you get up to around 60 gigahertz, the coherent part is really tough, and it's not going to get cheap in the near term. But you know, yeah, I mean, I, I'm also not a believer in 60 gigahertz, but um, that's what's available, and you know, apparently that's good enough for a lot of people to push it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I, I think uh, there are UV lasers around too. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, yeah. but I think we we when we look at this, I mean. We have moved our broadcasting industry, right? And nobody would believe that that would be possible, right? Sure. So if we in the mobile industry focus <coughs> and, and we can provide value to society, I think we can get spectrum. We, we are not sort of forced to go for 60 just because it's available today as our license. I have much, we must have much more bigger picture than that. I think if, if we have a good argument and can show the value, I think we can get much more spectrum that we need. True. I have a slightly different question since linked to your statement that LTE is well developed and so on. 
But then when you sort of talk at the lower end, at, at the devices, right, you're really talking about low efficiency battery operator. Yeah. But you know, truly there, you, you might want to consider something that is not an LMDM, right? Yeah, I agree. Right. So, so, so and, and that's the question, if, if, that, if, if that could be sort of integrated in this, through this sort of, this capillary network thoughts that, that right. I showed. But that would basically yeah. be a change of technology. Yeah, so, so, so that, that would be one way of interacting with, uh, or could it be so that we could pick one of these uh, alternative non 3 dpp technologies, that, which is around, and, and, and fully integrate it here, and lift it up, so to say, and, and make it part of this family from the top, I don't know. Or could we work together with, with one of these? And, and I think the low power Bluetooth is an interesting thing. It's not perhaps picked up on the market yet, but the momentum behind it and the players is, is huge, and the volumes would be much, much higher than anything else. Because um, Wi Fi is already on here, and perhaps this AH work that is being done would, would sort of come up as. as uh, as one of these, and, and then you can, of course, question should it be in here, in here, or is it actually one of these, and so on. But yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I'm, so I'm not. I'm saying that LTE would be a major part of this, right. but I recognize that there is complementing technologies. And then, then if it's a 50-50 split between the old and the new, or or if I mean, I don't know. So this is sort of how we would like to define this. And then the round of 5G is being discussed, right? So there's a lot of, lot of, I mean, you can't go to any conference now without having a couple of 5G panels, and there is a number of 5G workshops and so on. So all the current vendors and operators, governments, academia, every, everybody's on to this, so to say. And um, from an Ericsson perspective, we have put a lot of efforts into this METIS project, which we are trying to, at least in the European uh, view, a little bit as a focal point. But we need we need activities, not not copying that, but we need activities also in the US. I think that sort of collects a little bit and, and, and shapes uh, the US impact on on 5G in some way. So I think it's it's a little bit. Um, Interesting that this is still sort of started up here in, Euro in Europe and not here. And, uh, this is the most advanced 4G market. Yeah. The way you described it sounds like battleships before World War II. Everybody's given it a name. Yeah. They keep going with what they have and they go rolling along. Yeah. It sounds a little worrisome from that point of view. Yeah. When everybody's off on the same track, which is continuing the existing track by a factor of two or three, it no, doesn't look like it's going to solve the problem. No, no, I, I can agree on, on that. And, and if you just were to, to do this 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, factor 10 of everything here, I, I agree that that's, that is solving a part of the problem. It's not solving this net to connected society or the network society that the vision we have. Where all of these things is, is connected and so on. It's not. It's not that just part. It. It's, it's broader than that. I know. And one of the problems is the one that Frederick was talking about is batteries are never going to get any better. But uh, you know, you yeah. have Ebno for for any of these technologies. You run up the, the gigabits a second, and you're just pouring the jewels out of the battery. Yeah. yeah you can't. You can't do, as I said, unless you're going to go for a tritium right. battery, you haven't got a choice. I fully agree. You, we need to have sort of selected technologies for the different requirements. Because you went through this whole talk without saying anything about the fact that those 5.8 billion users have to have a micro USB attached to something and they go from one charging port to the next in order to keep going. Yeah, I think the smartphone for today, I don't know, my, my loss today approximately. You mean wireless charging is not in there somewhere? <laughs> no, I mean, it's a real problem. Yeah. But, but again, I think we need to, the, the smartphones, I think, I mean, my so kids okay. go from one USB port to the next yeah. to try to keep their phones connected. Yeah. But yeah. That, that sort of works, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, no? No, I think, I think if you have two billion users on, on a system, right, it sort of works. I think, I think the smartphone of today, I think we can take that off working. 
No, no, that's given. I agree. I mean, <laughs> try to take away, even if they have to go from USB. To oh, USB, no, they, try they, to take but in away terms of the, the thing that would make the most difference to their connectivity is being able to have your phone on and streaming at 100 kilobits a second for music, for example, without being plugged in, as opposed to getting 5 gigabits a second for some kind of 3D smell vision um, <laughs> that you do have to keep plugged in. Yeah. Yeah, but I think sure. to me that that sort of works. Uh, uh, but for the all these other things we could connect that are where you do, you don't have the possibility to charge every night, mm -hmm. then this is a huge issue. So and we have addressed that a little bit with this LTE release 12, but it's not really solved. So, so I, I was I was reading an article on this, right? Mm -hmm. There are people in India and perhaps many countries in Africa, and Nigeria was one example I, I, this article talked about where there are an incredible number of people who have access to a mobile phone, but they don't have electricity at home. Right. They so can't charge it. They go to no, the but if they go to you know, really charging station where you plug yeah. in. And so you um, so it's going to make a bicycle to charge. Yeah. yeah. In so Nepal, I mean, things, yeah. Yeah, in Nepal, right. water is cheaper than charging. Right. Even if they have solar panel, yeah. it's still cheaper. But uh, I'm not claiming that this is a done deal, right? I think there is a lot of research challenges. And I think you are sitting on, on, on a lot of the uh, competence and, and uh, possibilities to contribute in this. And uh, I, I made a list here, but, uh, but I, uh, this is sort of from, from my perspective. But I thought this future internet networking principles, services, security, that sort of is a one field software defined networking, cloud distributed computing, you know, sort of the management, the management also of the complex systems, multiple rat integration, spectrum management, ways to utilize shared spectrum, energy efficiency, disconnected devices, machine type, Internet of Things uh, part, the advanced antenna system, beam forming, beam tracking, understanding the propagation properties of these high frequencies and, and also radio front ends on, for, for this. So, so I, I think it's, it's all over, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, this will be a gradual development now and we are talking about 2020 and sort of beyond. So some research projects have started, you are part of some and there is, there is a, a huge possibility to contribute and to add into this. So we are interested to understand how to to collect and understand the ideas uh, coming also from from US in a little bit. I think we are more Ericsson. We are more sort of worked in, in in the European setup, and we, we are trying now to be part of the US also. So we really would like to have inputs. Uh, the beam forming that's always been traditionally hard in radio, and it's uh, inexpensively right. With the advent of metamaterials, you can move radio into the optical regime, where you work by changing this indices of refraction in, in these nano-fabricated materials. Do you have anybody looking into that for <coughs> from the from the actual external modulator point of view? No, no, no. no I think that's that's beyond what we are looking at. Not saying that is not interesting. I think it's a good good area for for contributions. Um, for us, it's still sh it's, it's enough challenging just to go to, to 20 gigahertz and building this sort of 210 element with the baseband and stuff in into one this, this box. Right. So, so that's where we have our focus on how to build that one. That's tricky. Yeah, it's, 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 it's complicated, right? Uh, but it's still sort of where we're stretching our current technologies in, into that. Uh, then if you do to talk about 60 gigahertz, I think you are all in CMOS and different building practices compared to that. I think that there are, there are a lot of interesting barriers or technology shifts even before we get to optics, let's say. There's a lot of things in this that, that we haven't really uh, figured out yet. Yeah, that, that's sort of approaching uh, the end here. So, um, LTE, I talked a lot about that. The 5G is needed here to fulfill all the requirements and uh, we really see a lot of possibilities for research contributions in this. 
So now we can open up for a little bit more, whatever. <laughs> so 